Boston hearing rather precipitously. I'm not going to go into all the details. <laughs> it's you! I know. How's your shoulder? Oh, I'm going to have to be careful. It's the left one. How are you? I'm good.
Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian, Universe, Unitarian Universalist Church here in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here and in person and virtually. My name is James Coombs, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect to the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways to be in community and in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. This Christmas Eve service is led by our interim minister, Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, with music by Dr. Zaneda Robles, Thomas Simpson, and featuring our fantastic choir and bell choir who you just heard. Please take a moment to silence your, your devices as we begin our service. And thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is being streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on guidance from our COVID safety team, Masks are recommended, though optional, for, for congregants inside and optional outside. Families with one young children are always welcome here in the sanctuary and or in the narthex. And we only have one announcement this evening. There will be no services tomorrow on Christmas Day or on January, on January 1st, and we will be back on January 8th, Sunday, January 8th. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are always available on the link, in the link in the Sunday email and posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of the hymnal. And you can always get more information on, of neighbor, on neighborhood church activities at our welcome table. And again, welcome to neighborhood church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive community connected by love, spirit, and service.
Blessed are we who wait <clears throat> with bated breath, who wait for something new to be born, for new hope or new joy or new life. Blessed are we whose patience grows thinner by the day, we who are tired of the world as it is, all of its heartache and loss and hopelessness, we who want more, more hope, more joy, more life. But blessed are we who sit here to wait at the still point between desire and expectation. We who are making room for more of you, O oh God, this Advent. Surprise us with joy in the midst of the mundane, abundance in the midst of so much scarcity, presence in the midst of the Christmas chaos. We have quieted our souls to listen, to wait for you, O oh God, for the words that bring us new life. Come, let us worship. Our opening hymn is number 253 in your gray hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing, O Come All Ye Faithful. On most Sunday mornings, we dedicate 100% of our offering to local organizations, nonprofits in the community that are in need of our support. But during the holiday season, we dedicate our offering to the Ministerial Discretionary Fund, 
which is something that exists so that I can give an immediate and confidential response to people among us who have needs that we may not be aware of. And it's such an important asset to have when people come to us, come to me, needing some support. And Carla Jamie Perez is gonna give a testimonial. It's such a blessing to be a member of this church in so many ways. And um, there's a wonderful saying that says, without a rich and giving heart, we are all beggars. And I just want to say that during the pandemic, we experienced um, a tremendous amount of loss at the very beginning. We didn't know what was happening and it caught us quite by surprise. And we were through our majority of our savings within the first year. Um, unfortunately, we had a health challenge that came up very suddenly with my partner, Marcy. And um, I didn't even know there was a ministerial discretionary fund and lovely people from the church said, you know, you need to ask, you need to go to, uh, you know, you need to go and you need to ask. And I was just so happy to, um, and, and not proud. <laughs> At that point I was not proud. Um, and I went to Reverend Teresa and I, I sent her an email telling her what had happened. And I was just utterly amazed at how quickly she was able through the ministerial discretionary fund to help us through that challenge. And um, I just, I, I encourage you in every way possible to give generously to it. It's for all of us within this church and any of us at any time can have a need that's unforeseen. God bless you all. Thank you, Carla. Will the ushers please come forward to receive this offering? Thank you for your generosity.
She says, the second line that I appreciate in the Annunciation story describes Mary's confusion, but she was much perplexed. It is not that the Annunciation leads her out of doubt and into faith. It is that her encounter with the angel leads her out of certainty and into holy bewilderment, out of familiar spiritual territory and into a lifetime of pondering, wondering, questioning, and wrestling. She was much perplexed. Or, as she puts it to Gabriel, how can this be? Debbie continues, like Mary, I was raised with a fairly precise and comprehensive picture of who God is and how God operates in the world. If anyone had asked me to describe God when I was 15, 20, or 30, I would have rattled off a list of divine attributes as readily as a kindergartner recites the af alphabet. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. God is holy, perfect, loving, righteous, merciful, just, and sovereign. What an interesting shock reality has been. <laughs> Who knew that my life with God would actually be one long goodbye? That to know God is to unknow God. To shed my neat conceptions of the divine like so many old snakeskins and emerge into the world bare, vulnerable, new, again and again. This, of course, is what Mary has to do in the aftermath of Gabriel's announcement. She has to consent to evolve, to wonder, to stretch. She has to learn that faith and doubt are not opposites, that beyond all the easy platitudes and pieties of religion, we serve a God who dwells in mystery. If we agree to embark on a journey with this God, we will face periods a bewilderment. In other words, it's when our inherited beliefs collide with the messy circumstances of life that we go from a two-dimensional faith to one that is vibrant and textured. Right from your seats, Please join me in singing carol number 240, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. We will sing verses one through three. Zenaida, could you sing the last two? Because it ends on a little dark note there. <laughs>
Thank you. Please join me in the spirit of prayer, of meditation, of reflection. Let us ground our bodies and open our spirits. As I share these words from my colleague, Victoria Safford. Now is the moment of magic when the whole round earth turns again toward the sun and hears a blessing. The days will be longer and brighter now. Now is the moment of magic when people broken down and beaten with nothing left but misery and candles in their own clear voices, kindle tiny lights and whisper secret music. And here's a blessing. The dark universe is suddenly illuminated by the lights of the menorah, suddenly ablaze with the lights of the canara, and the whole world is glad and loud with winter singing. Now is the moment of magic when an Eastern star beckons the ignorant toward an unknown goal. And here's a blessing. They find nothing in the end but an ordinary baby, born at midnight, born in poverty, and the baby's cry like bells ringing makes people wonder as they wander through their lives what human love might really look like sound like, feel like. Now is the moment of magic, and here's a blessing. We already possess all the gifts we need. We've already received all of our presents. Ears to hear music, eyes to behold lights, hands to build true peace on earth, and to hold each other tight in love. Amen. appreciative that we have this later service because now there's a chance that my homily might actually get heard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say the children were a little rambunctious for the early service. When I was young, I was obsessed with magic. Not just as a little kid, but even into my junior high years. 
<clears throat> at that time, my family lived out in the country, and the neighborhood kids and I kind of ran wild. In particular, the neighbors across the street from me and I shared an obsession with magic. Our favorite show was I Dream of Jeannie. I know that dates me. There are probably some among you who've never heard of it or seen it. So let me just explain to those of you who haven't had the great pleasure of my dream of cheating. It's the story about an astronaut who got stranded on an island in which he found a bottle in the sand. And when he rubbed the bottle clean and took off the stopper, all of a sudden, a genie came out, a beautiful woman named Jeannie. You get it, right? <laughs> she just magically appeared, and he was just astonished. And ast he was stuck on this island, and he couldn't get off. But since she was magical, she could make somebody come and rescue him and her. And she had already fallen in love with him by that point. So she was like, you're not going anywhere without me. So she goes back to Florida with him, and the show is really about a series of incidents in which she has to cover up the fact that she's magical. You know, you had to be there, I think, to really <laughs> experience. But what my friends and I became fixated on was that moment that Jeannie comes out from her bottle in a cloud of smoke. So we went down to the store and got these big cut glass bottles. I still remember mine was green. It was about this tall had a big long tube and a big round bottom. And so because we were in Texas, we went out into the fields and got smoke bombs <laughs> and threw smoke bombs into the bottles and then magically appeared when the smoke cleared. <laughs> but here's the thing, we weren't just playing. We believed in the magic. My friends also had a Ouija board. You remember Ouija boards? They're still out there, I think. You know that game which has a row of letters on it and it has this wooden plinth on it that you can move around when you ask it a question and it will answer your question by virtue of the letters that it chooses or that you choose. At one point, we asked the Ouija board something. I don't remember what, and we got an answer that completely freaked us out. I don't remember what. But we decided that there were evil spirits in the Ouija board. And so we were going to take it to our neighbors who had a leaf fire going and throw it in the fire so that it would kill the evil spirits. So we did. And it was a really windy day. The smoke from the fire was going everywhere. but. When the Ouija board got onto the fire, the smoke went straight up. Ooh. <laughs> Proof of its magical powers, we decided. I wouldn't say that I reached the point when I didn't believe in magic anymore, but I laid it aside for more adult pursuits. But when the Harry Potter books came out, and I knew that millions had become captiva captivated by the stories. It took me several years to read them because I didn't have kids. But the minute I sat down to read them, I was completely into it. I was taken right back to my childhood pursuits. And I realized that part of what made magic so compelling for me was that it made me feel powerful. When as a child, you feel anything but powerful. I mean, who wouldn't want to throw a pig's tail on an annoying cousin? <laughs> but to me, the power of magic isn't just about manipulation. It's about getting in touch with the values that we need to constantly be reminded of. In the Harry Potter books, those values are quite clear and pretty moralistic. Their lessons are universal, that love can always help us stand up to evil, that the choices that we make are more important than the bad thoughts that we may have, that we may not be able to control the future, 
but those from our past who loved us will always be with us. And that standing up to evil, even when it may cost you everything, is always worth the price. Now, if you sat down with young ones, like those young ones earlier this evening, and just told them the lessons that I just told you, it wouldn't really penetrate, would it? And it really didn't earlier, I promise. <laughs> you need the stories. You need, yes, the magic to make them meaningful and deep. We Unitarian Universalists tend to put much more faith in rationality than magic. We believe in the scientifically provable truth and get a little suspicious when it feels like something irrational comes before us. The scientific view, for example, would ridicule so-called primitive cultures who seem to believe that people such as witch doctors could use amulets, incantations to control the weather. But what if our literalist view of this story is missing something important? What if the witch doctor actually knows perfectly well that he cannot control the weather, but that the purpose of the rituals is to put people in closer relationship with the powers that control our, all of our existence, whether we like to admit it or not. There is something in that that we miss when we only take it literally. Some years ago, I met one of the NASA engineers who worked on the Space Shuttle Challenger, which tragically exploded in space, killing seven crew members who were aboard. It was a devastating thing for all of us who were around to witness. And it cast a devastating blow to the space program, which never really recovered after that. This engineer that I met said something really profound to me. He said, you know, the problem wasn't just the technology or the mistakes in the engineering. He said, we lost touch with the magic of what we were doing. Every rocket I built was a miracle to me. And when you stop believing in that miracle, when you begin to believe that you can control every aspect of it, that's when you make the worst kind of mistakes. Perhaps this is what I was seeking all those years ago, not necessarily a conviction that people could emerge from a bottle, but that something unknown and mysterious can appear. And that by following that stream of smoke into the sky, I could connect with the power of the universe. This is why I believe it's so important to remember and celebrate and elevate the magic of Christmas. It's not about a scientific exploration of whether virgin birth is possible or that the star in the east was really a comet, nor does the magic of Christmas really come through the presents that we receive or the wonderful food that we eat with family. The thrill of the best presents lasts only briefly. The family gatherings may be less than perfect or for some people painful or non-existent. The magic of Christmas lives in the metaphorical story that reminds us of the celebration of love that can heal all divisions, that can bring diverse people together to give honor to the promise of a new birth, that joy and peace are still possible even in the midst of pain and poverty and oppression. Why else would such a simple story carry such power that we would honor it, reenact it, retell it year after year, century after century? The magic of Christmas is not just the miracle of a new birth. It is the ability of it to reawaken our awareness of the magic that is always 
around us. I like to tell this story every Christmas because it imparts this basic message. It's about a three-year-old boy named Sam who attended the little school of Seattle, which met in the basement of a church, and they kept their general supplies in the foyer outside of the women's restroom. And Sam, being the curious toddler that he was, discovered a treasure trove in that women's restroom. A king-sized canister full of red glitter. Yes, upside down over his head, all over the restroom, down the hall, around the corner, into the director's office. But before anyone could mutter, oh my God, what a mess, Sam sang out, hands in the air, laughter on his face, you know what, you know what? There's Christmas in the bathroom. <laughs> Robert Fulgham tells this story. And he says, Christmas is and ever will be found where it is looked for. Most often close by, most always very underfoot, hidden away in the cupboards of our lives, waiting to be rediscovered in a rebirth of wonder, waiting to be dumped over our heads like blessing oil, waiting to be scattered like red glitter on the walls and hallways of a dark December. So if Christmas can be in the bathroom, it can be anywhere, anywhere that we need a reminder of love and joy and hope. The magic of Christmas is not about manipulating things to make it perfect. It's about holding ourselves open to the mystery and the power of the universe that speaks to us on a completely different level from our ordinary lives, the magical level. It promises a relationship that can sustain us far beyond physical realities, a relationship with that greatest of all spirits that allows us to feel hope and peace and love and joy just when we need it the most. This is the magic that I still believe in. It is a magic I invite you into. And now we're going to celebrate the magic of candle lighting in our candlelight service. And so I'm gonna ask the candlelight elves to come forward and help me. Now, this is the important lesson. Hold your candle straight, no. Whoever has the light is holding it straight. The person who has the unlit part goes like this. Then you don't get wax all over you like I did earlier.
Blessed are you in whom the light lives, in whom the brightness blazes, your heart a chapel, an altar where in the deepest night can be seen the fire that shines forth in you, in unaccountable faith, in stubborn hope, in love that illumines every broken thing it finds. Now let us stay seated and sing Silent Night. Even this late, it happens. The coming of love, the coming of light. You wake and the candles are lit as if by themselves. Stars gather, dreams pour into your pillows, sending up warm bouquets of air. Even this late, the bones of the body shine and tomorrow's dust flares into breath. Amen. Let us extinguish our candles and sing joy to the world. You can stand. <laughs>
is the moment of magic, and here's a blessing. We already possess all the gifts that we need. We've already received all of our presents, ears to hear music, eyes to behold lights, hands to build true peace on earth, and to hold each other tight in love. Amen. Go in peace.